Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Jackie Turnbull, who is the Chief People Officer of Topia. Jackie, would you tell us a little bit about what Topia does? Sure, yes. Thank you for having me. Uh, Topia is a platform that helps companies deploy and manage their employees all over the world. So if you think about uh, remote workers, business travelers, people on assignments, those relocating from one place mm -hmm. to another, we're a platform that helps manage the workflow, the compliance, and the data around all of those populations of people. Now, I've seen a number of companies asking employees to go back to the office, in some cases for five days a week, in some cases for four days a week. And you believe that there's a challenge with not offering flexibility to employees. So tell me what those companies are doing wrong and what are the challenges associated for companies with not offering flexibility to their employees? Yeah, I think that uh, flexibility is a key talent retention and attraction mm. driver. So I think by not offering this flexibility, what has happened is over the past few years through the pandemic, people have kind of gotten a, a taste of what it's like to have, whether it was forced um, flexibility or not, but they've gotten a taste of that and realized that they, they enjoy it, they want it. And so I think by not offering that, a company is risking increased turnover, which is really challenging mm. in, in the market right now. We, we know we've been in a war for talent for years, and sure. it's exacerbated right now as well. There's a study that showed that almost 70% of workers plan to leave their jobs in 2023. Um, mm. hiring, and we know hiring is incredibly expensive. So I think by, by creating that forcing mechanism um, away from a benefit or flexibility that we know people are asking for and people are wanting, mm -hmm. employers are setting themselves up for a lot of challenges there. The, the other side of it is diversity. I think by uh, a lot allowing flexibility really allows you to broaden your talent pool, which mm. inherently increases um, opportunities to hire diverse talent. So those two things, I think, are extreme benefits to having flexibility as an offering for any employer. And it's definitely the case that people want flexibility. We saw a McKinsey survey that found that of those who can do remote work, 87% would want to do some remote work. And for regarding diversity, we see that underrepresented groups definitely have a greater desire for remote work than non-underrepresented groups. So both of those are major challenges. Now, I helped 23 companies figure out their transition to hybrid work and remote work. And what I often see with HR professionals, so chief people officer, you might see this, is that there's often a little bit of a tension between managers, leaders, whether it's executives or mid-level managers who prefer more in-office work and employees who prefer, generally speaking, having more flexibility. How should HR professionals handle and mediate the situation given that they're often stuck in the middle? Yeah, I think one, it's talking about the benefits, right? So it's really educating managers, leadership, whoever is is averse to it as to why, mm -hmm. right? And that goes back to turnover. It goes back to retention. It goes back to diversity. So starting with why, why we're doing what mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, and I think the other piece is really digging into also why managers or leadership are fearful of this. What, why mm -hmm. are they feeling like they need to have people in the office? Is it something around a fear of productivity if people are working from home? Is it something around kind of the need to have that in-person interaction? Because I think really as you peel back the onion there and start to understand what's behind that, there are potentially other solutions to those concerns other than forcing people into an office. So to me, it's really important to understand mm -hmm. what's behind those motivations um, towards feeling the need to have people physically together. So let's talk a little bit about those manager concerns and complaints. What, so you talked about productivity, let's dive into that. What yeah. kind of concerns do managers have about productivity and what are some of the other tools that you mentioned to address those concerns without them getting them in getting people into the office because i definitely agree that getting in people into the office is not a great solution for productivity first of all we have extensive research showing that employees overall are more productive when they work from home they don't yeah. have to do the commute they're willing to devote some of the time to working on their job and that employees when they're forced to come to the office 
And when they don't want to come to the office, they're disengaged. I mean, one of the big contributors to the problem of quiet quitting, which is just a fancy way of saying serious disengagement, yes. is forcing people to come to the office and then doing the same stuff that they would be doing at home and then, then feel people feeling resentful about it. So that's not a great solution. So what are your thoughts about the solution there? Yeah, I think the, the big thing, when you focus on, when you talk about pro productivity, to me, uh, the objectives and things that you're looking at are business results. There's mm -hmm. no, I, I don't look at productivity as having a, a, being a magic HR metric that somehow we haven't cracked mm -hmm. how to measure. Um, I look at business results, right? So to me, the keys to measuring productivity are tools like setting uh, quarterly objectives and key results. We do mm -hmm. that here at Topia and we have a tool that we manage that through. And every manager works with their direct reports and we it cascades and it's transparent, mm -hmm. right? So if you set those correctly and you work directly with your team and you spend the time so that people are focused and clear on what they expect of, of what you expect of them and what is expected of them, then it, if at the end of the quarter or at the end of whatever that measurement period is, those are not met, that's your productivity conversation or your engagement conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not around, again, this other magic metric. So to me, it actually is, it shifts the conversation a little bit around where are you physically doing your work to what is the work you're doing? And I think that's a conversation we've also had a lot internally with our management mm -hmm. team over the past several years. It was a, quite a natural shift for us here into mm -hmm. completely distributed work and remote work, but it was really about managing to impact and managing to output rather than managing to hours worked. You don't need to be sitting mm -hmm. next to someone and have them clock in and clock out. Mm -hmm. You need them to do their job and get their job done. So how you clearly set those expectations and hold people accountable to that. To me, it's that simple. That's interesting. So I hear you about the quarterly OKRs and that's a great tool. What I find when I talk to managers, and like I said, I helped a number of companies transition, is that they tell me that, you know, for over a quarter, it's really hard for them to measure that productivity that would be a day-to-day, week-to-week productivity. So what I've instituted, what clients I helped is not having that quarterly one, but breaking that down into weekly performance reviews. So having that brief weekly performance review, most good managers already have one-on-ones with their, with their supervisees every week. So instead of just having the one one and check in, have the one on one as a performance evaluation. Set three to five goals, ideally smart, specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, timely, which are tied to the quarterly OKRs that would be for that week. And then for the following week at the performance review, see how well the supervisee did on those three to five goals and then evaluate their performance on those coach them on how to do better and agree on three or five goals for the next week. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be different for every person, every role, every manager and direct report relationship. So if what, what you're saying absolutely will work. And then I think it's basically the double click into the OKRs, right? So if we think about the OKRs or those longer term goals and, and the O, that objective is the high level, the key results are those milestones that you're meeting. So how tactical do you go within those key results? And then I absolutely agree with you. The structure that we have here is that those are the longer term and you can have multi-quarter OKRs, right? But yeah. We expect people to have at least weekly one-on-ones and we expect mm -hmm. OKRs to be part of those conversations. So you are talking about obstacles, you are measuring um, achievement against those. And if you wanna break it down to your point and have that be even more granular and that works for people, absolutely. But I also think there's a fine line between micromanaging and that's where I say, I think it's mm -hmm. a little bit of gonna be dependent on the role, the level of the person, because you know, if I if the CEO was doing that with me, I would probably sit and say, wait a minute, I think I have it under control. I don't need you to manage week over week, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's yeah. gonna be really dependent on the situation, but absolutely that will work. And and it also industry, every industry is going to be a little bit different as well. Sure. And with uh, people at your caliber, we do monthly ones instead of having the weekly ones. Sure. Yes, yeah. of course, adapting that to the situation. Now, I want to flip the script a little bit and talk about management capacity with productivity, because one of the concerns I find with managers is that they tell me when we're trying to do the transition, they're saying, well, when workers are working remotely, I find they're procrastinating, they're not getting the tasks done that I'd, I want them to get done. 
And when we dig deeper, what we double click on that, we find that what's happening is actually not a problem of productivity. The person's actually getting more done, but a problem of coordination. The manager is not able, doesn't have the skill set to coordinate and manage as effectively workers who are remote because they're used to managing in person. So you know, things change, plans change, right? And then when they things change, they have a harder time of getting a hold of remote workers. And then they, rather than if those people are in the office and they can just go over to them and talk to them. And so that is a problem that I found would be an issue of management capacity. How are they actually managing? So not a productivity problem. I'm curious if you run into that. Yeah, we've seen it. I think we leaned in pretty heavily in the beginning of, of this shift. So early on in the pandemic around managing remotely. And we mm -hmm. really leaned in on this idea of trust and managing to output. And I think the key, and it's exactly what you were saying, is communication. So mm -hmm. it's setting expectations. Um, with my team, they know, hey, I don't expect you to be tied to your computer all day long. If you have an errand, you need to go or an appointment, please go for it but communicate with me. So I know if you need to be offline for an hour or two, I won't bug you and I can plan accordingly. And I think it's it's that simple because that is something you would know if you were sitting next to someone in an office. And it's just being able to translate that into this remote capacity. And that to me is foundational with trust. And so mm -hmm. it's about working with your managers to go beyond kind of this rigid structure and really build trust with their team. And that comes with a bit of flexibility and let it, showing people, demonstrating that you trust them to get their jobs done, but also holding them accountable. And in turn, I think that uh, increases the, the open lines of communication between any direct report and their manager. Communication is definitely key. and Having that autonomy and trust and balance of accountability. Now, I wanted to ask about another aspect of remote work and hybrid work, which is burnout. There's been a lot of concern about burnout and remote work, hybrid work. What's your take on that question? Yeah, I think there's there's two sides of it, right? So on one hand, remote work, some people think actually leads to more burnout because it really blurs the lines between mm -hmm. life inside of work and outside of work when you're sitting in your bedroom working. And then, you know, it's, uh, so there's that side of it where people are actually showing that they're working more. Mm -hmm. And I think the flip side of it is there's also extreme benefits to remote work that help mm -hmm. combat burnout. So there are things that companies can do. And then, and then I think there are also things that individuals need to hold themselves accountable to, to learning how to do as well. Um, so I think the key behind this, and, and there is studies that show this is that employees who are feeling more likely to burn out are ones where they feel like their company is either lagging in some sort of technology or where mm. they don't feel like they actually have flexibility. So um, it, the more flexibility you can give as an employer and the more you can invest in technology, I actually think combats that rem remote work kind of burnout correlation there. Because if you give mm. people the opportunity to you have a remote work policy in place that says you can work from X places a certain number of days a year. It gives people that feeling of, okay, I don't need to always be in my bedroom. I can go do this. I can spend a long weekend somewhere and work for a few days. Um, and also techno we know technology is key in these environments. It can, back to what we were talking about, it can help with streamlining communication. It can help with mm -hmm. you know objectives. It can help with all of these things. So as much as possible that companies can invest in those two things actually really think can help combat burnout. I want to get to one part of point that you said, which is about expectations. One of the things that I found really works well with my clients is setting clear expectations of how people work and when they work. So for example, not responding to emails outside of work hours unless there's a specific emergency of some sort or sure. having something like, well, if you're going to be working long hours, you know, not expecting to do that more than once a week, something like that, kind of an, on a regular schedule. Of course, if there's an emergency, we can address that, but not on a regular basis, not more than once a week. Then setting expectations of how quickly you should answer emails and Slack messages or Microsoft Teams messages. So we have something like a common time set for 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. where people are expected to answer their Slack messages within 30 minutes of receiving a message and their emails within an hour of receiving their emails. Otherwise, not 
expecting that same sort of promptness. So addressing those communication issues so that people don't feel pressured to always be connected to their work smartphone and answering emails. What are your thoughts about setting boundaries and expectations? I am a big fan of it. Uh, so I would say from there are ones to set at a company level there and then at a team level and at an individual level. So to me, there are different varieties of this at a company level. As an example, uh, Topia, a few years ago, we introduced internal Zoom free Fridays, which is mm -hmm. not a hard and fast rule, but as much as possible, we try and avoid internal Zoom meetings on Fridays to give people a chance to have their video off and not feel like they have to kind of be on. So that's, and, and we've actually also said, folks, again, culturally, we are managing to your output. We are not managing to you clocking in at one time and clocking out at, at, the, at the next. And that is industry specific roles, right? So not possible for everyone, but as we've set these cultural norms, um, we also work with a global team. So it's mm. not as much possible to, you have to know for myself, I'm on the West coast of the US. If I right now in the afternoon, send a Slack message to my colleague in Estonia, I cannot expect a response mm. uh, within 30 minutes, right? So we try and operate with on kind of a 24 hour rotation. And, and we're also trying to really build empathy of understanding everyone's got mm. a lot going on. So, at a company level, we've set them. Then at a team level. So with, again, like I said, within my team, I have set expectations of, hey, you know, here are, I expect you to be accessible during the working hours of your local time zone, right? Because all three of us work in different time zones. And if you're not going to be, tell me, tell me, just communicate that to me. Or if I need to get in touch with you because there is an emergency after hours, what's the best way to do that? What's your preferred method? Because I don't want you feeling like you have to have your Slack notifications on all night mm -hmm. by all means. But is it a text? Is it a call if something emergency comes up? So, and then I think it's up to people to set their own boundaries, right? Know that, hey, my Slacks are snoozed from 9 p.m. until 6 a.m. Because otherwise I would be getting notified all throughout the night from sure. my global Team, right. So there's a bit of give and take on both sides, but I think the setting the idea of setting these expectations and communicating them are incredibly important in this kind of fluid, dynamic, remote work environment. Excellent. So I think we covered the points I wanted to cover. What do you think is the future of hybrid work and remote work in our world, given that there are some companies that are requiring their employees to go back to the office, but also the topics that we discussed here today? Sure. I think the pendulum is unfortunately shifting a little bit back towards the employers mandating this. We're seeing it more and more, like you said. Um, and, you know, the past few years, as we've talked about things like the great resignation and the talent shortage, it's been really an employee's market. Unfortunately, I think we're shifting back towards an employer's market. Um, I hope not too much because I am a big fan of the employee market. It should be about employee experience and doing what's right for employees employees. Um, so I think we're going to feel it shift a little bit from the extreme that it's been the last few years, but not entirely. Um, people, like I said in the beginning when we were talking, people have gotten a taste of what it's like to have flexible flexibility, and I think they're going to demand it. And top talent is going to put their foot down and demand it. And I think companies are going to need to adapt. And I, I really hope they do, again, because I, people are asking for it, and it, we need to deliver on that for the employee experience. That's, I think it's a great message to end on. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check this out and leave a review. It really helps us improve the show and helps other people discover the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.